Hey there, Knicks fans. How you doing? It's your boy, Jonathan Macri, with you for another episode of the Knicks Film School podcast. Uh, recording this with or uh, at not even nine in the morning as of yet, um, but excited to to talk to my friend here who I have not had a chance to speak to yet about. Uh, I haven't talked to you since since before Sunday, right? Jeremy, Cullen. correct. Hi. <laughs> hey, John. Yes, so, we haven't. Yeah, no. So we haven't had a chance to talk about how the season ended. We haven't had a chance to talk about the two seed. Haven't had a chance to talk about, um, I guess, the decision to like win a basketball game uh, last weekend. Uh, I don't know what we need to, if we need to even say anything else about that. What's done is done. And certainly have not had a chance to talk about uh, the fact that the Knicks are playing the Philadelphia 76ers because that happened less than uh, 12 hours ago as we are recording this. Um, so I will just open by asking you how you doing and what's up? What's new <laughs> in your life? The Knicks are in the playoffs and it's a great they feeling. Are. And it's nice to know exactly who they are playing. Uh, so now they can actually decide to game plan accordingly. It's crazy how the two seed and the one seed's reward is less time to prepare for their opponents. But uh, such is the structure of the playing tournament. But, you know, it's the, uh, you got to, Beat the best to be the best. And of course, the Knicks drew an opponent that might be better than your average seven seed. And yet, at the same time, there are cracks in the armor for Philadelphia. There are weaknesses to exploit, just like there would be for any other team. So, you know, am I am I happy, sad, frustrated, whatever you want to call it, with the Sixers? What, how am I feeling? Um, I'm feeling energetic. I feel like this is a team that has proven all year long that they're confident that they're talented and that they mm. know how to function in high stress situations. And I think they can take on any team. I don't know if they can beat every single team in a seven game series, but I like their odds. Yeah. I like the fact that they're an underdog team. It kind of fits in with their whole mentality. So bring on the 76ers and the Acela express should be a great one. <laughs> I, you know, I've never taken the Excella Express. It's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's lovely. Actually, I, I could even go a step further than that. I don't know that I've ever taken, not to derail the pod right at the top, because I know we're pressed for time. I don't know that I've ever taken a train in this country other than like local transit within within a city. I don't know that I've ever taken a, tra- a train from a, one city to another city. In this country, I've done it in uh, when I was in Italy. I took a train from mm-hmm. like one city to another, but I never in this country. Is it is it fun? Is it good? It is, but uh, in Europe, it's a lot better because of the infrastructure. So yeah. there you go. Not as great here. Not as great here. Well, like many things. Um, so let's. So we're gonna do a, a, a. We have a bit of a structure for this episode. We're gonna do. I don't know if we decided on. Uh, I guess our each of our three biggest questions, three three biggest questions, three big, biggest curiosities, three big whatever, three things that we're interested in or we're wondering about heading into this series. Um, but I, it, I, you just brought up the the preparation time thing. Three biggest questions, Andrew's telling me, um, and it's funny. I had never thought about that as a potential disadvantage for the higher seed until literally. <laughs> To literally right now. And in the case of Boston, again, Boston doesn't care in this instance, right? They won 64 games and they're very good. And one the team that they're going to be playing, it looks like whether it's the Heat or the um the Bulls are going to be banged up in some form or fashion. Uh but like they're only going to have two days to prepare for for those teams because those the, the, that game is Friday night and then this Celtics game tips off at some point on Sunday. Um yeah, I don't know. Do, do, did you ever give much credence to the whole like certain that maybe the top two seeds should be able to pick their opponents thing or, or no? No, because I think it also opens a can of worms, which is uh, you could get what you ask for in certain cases. It just it removes the competitive nature of letting it play out that the whole season yeah. you play out to see seeding. Why shouldn't you do it with the seven, eight seeds uh, in the playing tournament? Just get or, you know, get in. Win your games and you're in. That's fine. Yeah. And if you're the best two teams, then you should be able to face the teams that slot into seven and eight. But 
there is a disadvantage. The disadvantage, though, also goes to, say, the team that gets the eighth seed because they only have two days to prepare for Boston. It's more comparative between the one and two seeds versus, say, the Bucks, who have been locked in and know exactly who they're facing since the end of Sunday's games. Sure. Um, yeah, I. So we'll, well, let's turn to our. Who, who, Andrew, who goes first? Because we we can't even use the season series between us as the tiebreaker as to who gets to pick to go first because we tied. How about you How go about first, John? <laughs> what? How about you go first, John? Age before beauty. Yeah. Okay. Um. So I'm gonna. I hope the my first question is not like too overarching to the point where it, it's like you you could talk about the whole series within under the umbrella of this question, but I think. Yeah, the Embiid piece of it is obviously is a massive part of what I'm about to ask. And if you want to be more specific towards Embiid, I'll I'll leave that to you. I guess my first question is, what 76ers team are are we getting? Because, and I I should have had this up before I started talking, but I'll I'll put it up right now because I know it's the this where exactly I'm going for it. But like when when Joel Embiid first went out this season, so and just to to give people a little bit of a little bit of backtrack. Like he was missing games here and there. He actually missed two games in a row before there was ever any injury. And then he missed four games in a row. And then he missed, uh, played, came back to play two and then missed three games in a row. And then, so like he was missing time with like, it wasn't just, he was sitting out for like, because it was a second night of back to back or he was like sitting out for rest or whatever the hell the Sixers were doing with him. Like he was missing Actually, with one exception, every time he missed a game before the injury, he missed a second, at least a second consecutive game to that. So he was like kind of banged, not banged up. I don't know what the phrase is. And I I feel I don't want to say banged up because when he played, as has been said a million times, he was on a pace to have more points per minute than anybody since Will Chamberlain. And, And I think he had actually exceeded that in the in the game, in the final game that he played. Which was against the Warriors on June or on January 30th. That was his last game until he just came back recently in the, in the last month. He had missed the two games before that. Only played 30 minutes in that game. Scored 14 points. Um, from what I recall, did not did not look great. Look, look great. But if we if we go just up until that date, which again there are a lot of games uh, before that date that Joel Embiid uh, did not play. But if we include that date, and again, we're not we're not taking out the ones that he that he missed. At that point in the season, the Philadelphia so, so 76ers had the third best net rating in the league at plus six point five points per possession. Now, the Knicks at the time, coming off of their best month in in decades, were right behind them at plus six point four points per hundred possession. And you could argue that the Knicks had had just as many uh not ups and downs, but like they had the whole first two and a half months of the season before they made the OJ and OB trade that their 6.4 net rating at that time on January 30th was obviously largely impacted by that. The month where the team was like running rush out over everybody, including by the way, the Philadelphia 76ers. Um, but they had Julius Randall. The team we're seeing now is, is different, but I don't, I'm not sitting here wondering anything about this Knicks team because I feel like I have a very good idea about what this Knicks team is that we're getting. Whereas the Sixers, again, third best net rating at the time and beat first one out, sixth best um, offense and uh, eighth best defense. So top eight in both. And, and that team contained not only a very healthy Joel Embiid or healthy, pretty healthy. I mean, it seemed pretty healthy, but also DeAnthony Melton. That team did not contain Kyle Lowry. That team did not contain Buddy Heald. And, uh, Kelly Oubre was on the team, although I don't know how much he had really played because he had that incident earlier in the year. And I, even when he was playing, I would have to look up like how big a role he was playing. Like th- the point is, this is a fundamentally different team, and you can look at the numbers with Embiid and Maxi on the court together and say, well, that's really what matters, and those numbers are outstanding. But even that assumes health. It assumes like those two guys are at the peak of their powers, and and. A lot of what Maxi's able to do successfully, I think, depends on 
what Embiid is able to do successfully, again, based on his health. So I just, I, you know, before, I, you know, again, you were talking about like, you, you know, the, what you get as your a top seeded opponent. Like, is, is this one of the better lower seeds in NBA playoff history? I, we, can, how could we know that? without knowing what version of the Sixers we're watching. So that's I, I, it's a very long-winded way of saying of like, what, who are we facing? What is this team that we're facing? And I just, I don't really know. Yeah, I guess I'll, uh, I'll add on to that by saying my first question, sure. which is what will this 76ers team look like? And will it feature D'Anthony Melton? Because okay. Embiid is obviously a force. There's no doubting superstar potential. I also know from looking at him that he looks like he's lumbering. He looks like he's in severe discomfort. And you know, I've, I've got a friend who's a Sixers fan who feels like Embiid's not going to play seven all seven games. And whether or not that's really? true, it, it you know, like is that an internalized, uh, conditioned feeling because you see Embiid your whole career or his whole career and you're in the uniform? Yes, probably. But it goes to the larger point of, of course, how great is this Sixers team going to be if their best player is not as effective in a way that they should be. But when it comes to D'Anthony Melton, um, Melton's a fantastic glue piece that has really missed significant amount of time. But in terms of lineups, if you look at the 300 best lineups, uh, or sorry, 300 uh, possession lineups and more on cleaning the glass, the number one lineup in terms of difference is Philadelphia. It's Maxi, Melton, Batum, Harris, and Embiid. That's a plus 33.3 difference. 98. How many minutes? That's four. It's at least 300. And this unit had 467. Sorry, at least 300 possessions. And this unit had 467, not minutes, should be possessions. With a, um, with so, a healthy Melton. Healthy Melton. And of course, this would imply a largely healthy Embiid. Healthy Embiid, yeah. Now, it's worth mentioning, though, that the second best lineup played 331 possessions. Instead of a plus 33.3, it was a plus 33.1, 98th percentile as well. And that also belongs to a team that we're talking about, which is the Knicks. That is (laughs) Brunson, McBride, DiVincenzo, Hart, and Hartenstein. Now, I don't expect that lineup to be used quite as much. I would gather that Tibbs is going to lean heavily on Josh Hart continuing to start. But clearly, there is at least a four-man unit that can grow. The question being, is it going to be McBride? Is it going to be Hart? But Melton, I mean, you know, the defense is there. He, he's very much a glue guy. Is he going to be able to kind of patch up the areas where the Sixers really need the help? Uh, not the greatest shooter, but a good shooter, enough to keep you honest. And with the fact that Embiid is not able to do, probably as an individual talent, from a scoring perspective, what he would if he were healthy. His passing um, has been fantastic this year. And when he finds guys out, you know, with looks out of the double team and the players that he's finding are better shooters than they have been in the past, it lends credence to, okay, well, do you want to, is the game plan perhaps to let Embiid have his and shut everyone else down? Kind of in like how UConn shut down Purdue and let Zach (laughs) Eady eat. And it was like, we'll just close off everyone else. Or do you focus your energy in the opposite direction? Do you just say, if we shut down and beat at the head, do we kind of close off all the shooters in that way too? So um, a lot of it will come down to Melton and how he's able to shift the game plan. It's a, it's a great question. And as you're talking about that, it reminds me of something that Benji and DJ were talking about last night. Um, after the Sixers heat game ended, which is like, you know, the, talking about the different ways you could defend and be talking about the different ways you could deploy OJ and Obi. I was doing the, I was taking some super chats after that. And somebody was like, are you worried about what with Tibbs? Like uh, showed a lot of respect to Jimmy Butler in the playoffs last season, even though Jimmy Butler was hobbled, you know, occasionally doubling Jimmy Butler. And then he would of course make, uh, a correct pass and uh, oftentimes the Sixers that he would or excuse me the Heat players that he would pass to would like make a shot and it's like well why are you giving so much attention to Jimmy Butler he's he's hobbled like you, you talk about letting Joel Embiid eat can can he can he eat you know like right now in his in his current 
form. I don't know the answer like to and and if you if you just challenged this version of Embiid to beat you one on like like just like hey man we're we're playing you basically straight up now are they going to exclusively play him straight up there's no world where they're going to exclusively play him straight up they're going to try to do other they're always going to try to mix it up um but i do think a, a couple of fundamental differences between this year's team and last year's team and this is no shade on, on Josh Hart I don't feel like they felt like Josh Hart was like the level of like a stopper. I don't think they've ever felt that way about Josh, Josh Hart. I mean, I love Josh Hart. Josh Hart's a very good defender. Um, I actually think it deserves some consideration for all defense um, just because he like always guards a good def- uh, offensive player. He's played a million minutes, but he's not, he's not a stopper. And so it was Hart on Jimmy. And he still felt like, all right, maybe we, we kind of got to give a little something extra, extra here. Isaiah Hartenstein has been so good. As you've talked, you've trumpeted this from the rooftops, you know, for literally years, looking at his defensive EPM and everything. Um, like, yeah, I, I, and then behind him is Mitch. We'll see what Mitch has. But like, I trust Hartenstein to re- to like go handle that one on one. And then when you also factor in OJ and Anobi into the mix now, but so. I, not to get ahead of myself, I, I work. These are kind of all coming together. My my second question is: How do the Knicks deploy OJ and Obi? And I'm stealing this one from Benji and and DJ from last night because so like this is why they got this guy right for a series for any playoff series, but it, like a series like this where he is he's the queen of the chessboard on defense at least, but there's only one. You only get one. Queen, unless well, unless you get your pawn across the across the way, um, that's tough. <laughs> it is, you, you know, my biggest regret is when I was first teaching my daughter how to play chess. I was like, you know, if you get your your pawn across, you you can you can, you can become a queen, and then she concentrates on that so much uh, to the detriment of like actually playing chess and it's, it's not great anyway um but there's no you know, there's only one edge you know, OJ and Obi. you're not getting another one and so you have two when healthy devastating one-on-one players here in this series obviously you're not going to use OJ and Obi to like you know you're not going to set it up so that OG is guarding uh and B Hartenstein is going to be great in that role but then there's Maxi and Maxi you know, and again, I don't want to repeat too much of the, the pod that we just recorded last night, but like I agree with DJ and I agree with Benji that maybe the 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 OG on Maxi, like of all of the sorts of players that OG could guard, having him chase around Maxi, I feel like is the maybe not least use of his talents, but like it's it's not what I really wanna see. Whereas you you know, you give McBride a chance. Obviously, McBride's on the starting lineup, although you just brought up those numbers. How much more time should he get? I just, you know, I'm really curious because if you did last thing, I'm going to throw, I know I've been talking for a while. If you do have him in an off ball role with the not off ball role, but you know, like on one of, on one of the Sixers lesser players um, with the express purpose of having him be able to rotate over to, you know, whether it's, you know, you're, you're, you're doing a, a uh, trap on Maxi or or whatever you bring into it and be like he can cover for whoever's helping, you know, by cut by helping off of his guy, and then you just trust your rotations from there. Is that like it's not overcomplicating it because that's what the Knicks have always done. They've they've used OG in so many different ways. He's great at this. The Knicks are really good at defensive rotations. Like we should be really confident in that. It just I, I it is very. Um, it feels like a big decision and it's not, again, it's not going to be one decision. They're going to do a lot of different things, but that's my, that's my second question for, for the series. Yeah. At least how will they start the playoffs? They, because exactly. It, yeah. It, playoffs are all about adjustments and making them and the Knicks will make adjustments and the Sixers will make adjustments and it will constantly a battle of trying to one up the other. And yeah. I'm with you in that. How, how do we start to see the Knicks deploying OG Ananobi? Because I feel there is a world where they put him on Embiid quite a bit just to spice things up. Just switch it up. And sure. then and then the Sixers say, okay, well, if they're going to put OG on Embiid quite a bit, then 
let's mix something up and they try something different. And then the Knicks will respond and they say, okay, well, OG was doing great there, but now we have to tackle this. So let's go away from that. And just the, the chess pieces here of moving it back and forth with how it's going to go. But it's, it's a very valid question because you have this Swiss army knife that can guard one through five if you really want it to. Mm. And so how do you, how, where do you start? And agreed in terms of maybe having, like, you're not going to stop everyone. He can't be everywhere, everything, everywhere at once, but <laughs> you can at least put him in the positions that you feel most comfortable with. And perhaps it is going to be just letting one of their players get theirs, but you live with it because so many other players are struggling and you can contain it that way. So I, I, I'm with you in terms of the question of how they're going to start off with OG and, and how he'll be used. I do just want to say for anybody wondering in terms of OG's minutes, because obviously he was playing a ton of minutes before the original injury. And then, um, you know, it, like, is he compromised in the last game of the season against Chicago? He played 42 minutes. Um, and in, let's see his second game back against the bucks played 38 minutes in a game after that, which was uh, at Chicago I played 35 minutes. It does not seem does not seem like there are any minutes restrictions on OJ and Obi. And when you look back at his initial run with the Knicks from when they got him until he, when he first went out, the dude was averaging 35.7 minutes a game. And there were within that, there were two, the two blowouts against Denver and against um, the Sixers didn't even crack uh, 30 minutes in either of those. There was a game in Washington. There was another blowout that he didn't crack. Uh, he, he played 31. There was a Portland blowout. He played 29. So like, if you look at his average in games that actually mattered and how much he was playing in those games, he was playing 40 minutes a night. In some cases, more than 40 minutes a night. So I, I would... I It's not one of my questions, but it's kind of a, an associated question to the one I just asked. Like, who lead the who leads the Knicks in minutes in the series? That's an interesting one. I I, I could see there being uh, probably three different answers between OG Hart and and Brunson in this series. Mm -hmm. But I digress. So my question is, how are the Knicks winning or playing the backup point guard minutes that don't it don't involve Jalen Brunson? You stole one of my questions. Sorry, but that's it's a lead. It's a serious concern because you now are exposing yourself in a way where we saw last year when the Knicks did not have Jalen Brunson on the floor, especially in game six, it did not benefit them. In fact, I would argue that they lost that battle and that was not the primary reason that they went home in six games, but that was a significant factor. And it's kind of a question of how do you, how do you match it up? How do you line up these minutes accordingly? Because I anticipate that Brunson will be playing North of 36 minutes per game every oh, game. I mean, I would imagine it'll be closer to 38 to 40. So let's say it's eight to 10 minutes. What direction do you go? I mean, there's the prevailing thought of, we just talked about OG and Anobi, plus minus God. Do you have OG and his plus minus in while you don't have Brunson on the floor? Because at least you can stop the bleeding in some capacity. Well, I was curious, so I looked this up. If you have OG and Anobi on the court, and you take off Brunson and let's also take off Randall because he's injured and yep. you take out Quentin Grimes because he's no longer on the team. Uh, and yep. of course some other players wouldn't be involved like RJ Baird and Manuel quickly with OG because they never were teammates. If you look at those three players off the court and OG on the court, then you would see a difference on cleaning the glass of positive 18.2. That's good enough for the 99th the percentile. The problem of course, as you were uh, on to it is, <laughs> There are only 50 possessions. So this is go. basically not meaningless, but not a whole lot to work with here. So how the Knicks are going to bridge that gap of solving the non Brunson minutes is such a key question because I legitimately don't know, John, I, you know, there are a lot of players where it seems like, Oh, like, like Deuce McBride, for example. Right. I understand the idea of, well, he's been playing really well in the regular season. So, Perhaps Tibbs gives him more free reign. And maybe that happens one or two games. But the guess that I walk in there with is Tibbs is going to go with the players he trusts the most. Who does he trust the most? It's probably not Deuce McBride. 
And there will be moments where he subs him in because he feels that he's built for this and able to do it. But it's not the level of trust that I see him giving Hart or Ananobi um, or maybe even DiVincenzo. So where the Knicks go in those eight to 10, let's call it minutes for backup point guard. Very curious. So a couple things. Um, so Jalen Bronson <clears throat> obviously has played a, a ton uh, this year, but as it was pointed out last night, um, he has been kept a, a little, a little fresher um, over the the course of the you know over the last like bit of the season. I'm just like I'm pulling up his minutes log right now towards the end of this year. Uh, he did play 41 minutes in the season finale against the Bulls, but again, like kind of take that with a grain of salt. Went at the overtime, like they had come that far, um, you know. In here, I'm just going to read off the, the handful of games for that: 36 minutes against the Nets, uh, 30 minutes against the Celtics, but that was a blowout. 42 minutes against the Bulls in Chicago, 39 minutes against the Bucks in Milwaukee, 41 minutes against the Bulls in Chicago, 38 minutes against the Kings at home. Um, and but there, there's a clear line of demarcation before that because before that, much more conservative minutes totals, with the exception of the the Spurs game, which went into overtime, and he was up, you know, had one of the greatest regular season games of all time for the Knicks. But you can tell he's been starting to ramp up in terms of the minutes now. In terms of last year's playoffs, he Brunson averaged, um. 40.3 minutes per game, but that number is deceiving for a couple of reasons. For one, he was in foul trouble in game one against Cleveland, played under 30 minutes, hardly played in the first half of that game. Um, and the two games, both games, uh, two and games three were blowouts in on in different sides. The game two, the Knicks got blown out, game three, the Knicks blew out the Cavs. He played 36 and 30, just under 38 minutes in those games. In games Four through 11 of the playoffs, Jalen Brunson averaged 42.4 minutes, which means he was sitting for about five and a half minutes a game. Now, as Benji made the point last night, Brunson is doing so much more now, I think, in terms like he's moving around a lot. Like, so can you? I do not expect him to be playing 42 plus minutes a game out of the bat or right or, or right out of the gate. That said, <laughs> That said, in the six games, I, I like that you cited the OG numbers, and I, I do think that that is very meaningful. And I absolutely expect OG to be on the court with Bogdanovich and uh, McBride, and then one of the other two guys, um, Hart or DiVincenzo, and then we'll see about the center during the non Brunson minutes. I, but I, I, I would be surprised if we didn't get that trio of McBride, Bogey and OG. And they've had some promising, they've had some promising moments in, in, in since OG's come back. That said in the last six games of the season, when Brunson has not been on the court again, only 62 minutes. So like one terrible stretch may have completely skewed the sample size. They're getting outscored by 21 points per hundred possessions, 20.7 to be exact. And the, the offense has been bad. It, oddly, the funniest part, though, the defense has been a train wreck. They've been giving up 136, or excuse me, 130.6 points per 100 possessions. Now, I again, that's to me says maybe take that sample size with a a, a little bit of a grain of salt because like the, I there's no reason why the defense should fall apart if Jalen Brunson's off the court like that. Those two things should not correlate. Um, but even so, an offense like 109 point whatever, like that's not good. It's not awful. And in fact, if you g- compare it to a lot of the non Brunson minutes over the course of the last two years, it's pretty, it's actually pretty great. Like there's been a lot of segments of non Brunson minutes where it's like, can we score 100 points for 100 possessions? So 109, again, not the end of the world. But um, no, I think it's, I think it's a fantastic. Do you, do you agree with me that the three players I assume will be on the court? During the non Brunson minutes, that uh, do you think they will all they will be out there? In terms, In terms of, Bogey, of Mc, Bogey, McBride, and OG Ananobi. Yes, although I'm very curious in terms of how effective Bogdanovich is going to be. I mean, as as Chris Persiani reported, there was uh, some some work done in terms of his wrist. There's clearly an injury going on there. Matchup dependent. You know, is it 
is it going to be him? Like, is there, is there a world where we see more precious Achua minutes than we do Boyan Bogdanovich minutes simply because of how they want to guard and beat? I mean, Achua has seen time on and beat before, I believe it hasn't been a train wreck. So, you know, like, is there, in terms of Mitch, how effective is he going to be given I think Mitch working with Embiid? Point. It's not the best. I don't love that matchup, but and I don't think there's going to be a ton of time where we'll see Mitch and Embiid together, but those stretch bigs have always given Embiid trouble. You mean Mitch trouble? I'm sorry. It's always, yeah, yes, Mitch. I do. Too early. Mitch trouble. No, I completely Mitch agree. Just, that's just not his bread and butter. That's not who he is best deployed against. Yeah. Um, I think we might see Precious at the five minutes. I'd be very surprised if we saw, unless it's for like a couple minutes here or there, unless maybe someone gets in foul trouble or multiple people get in foul trouble. I'd be really surprised if we saw Precious at the four minutes just because like, look, we know we know what the spacing concerns are. If we do see those, I would guess it would be with both hard, with like basically all your offense first play, like basically like, uh, like Brunson, DiVincenzo, maybe bogey and Hardenstein. So it's like a really offense heavy lineup, but that you're, you're, you're bolstering with precious and, and Hardenstein, you know, and I guess Steven Chenzo to a certain extent on, on defense, he could deploy him. I, I can, I also wonder about the, what, how, what bogey is going to give them. And I don't know if the Sixers are quite built to exploit the bogey matchup uh, when like bogey's on defense, to, to the extent that maybe we've seen at times, I mean, obviously all it takes is him getting switched on to maxi for a couple of possessions in a row. And if the Knicks can't avoid that, then like that's, that's going to be death. Cause I don't think, Bog- I don't think, I don't think they want bogey out on an Island uh, on, on Tyrese maxi at any point in time in the series. So yeah, I, I think that's, I think that's a great call. Um, okay. I can, I have a couple of different things in, on the docket for my, for my third question, I want to, you know, we, we do narrative, like narratives, narrative stuff so much on the, uh, when we get together, I, I want to avoid that for now. I, I don't want to get into big picture. Like, Oh, what does it mean? If they lose this series, what it means? Let's win this series. Like, I don't, I don't want to get, I want to focus on the series itself. So I guess I am. I guess I'm going to stick with this. Who, who emerges and emerges might be the wrong word because I think we kind of know what it is already. But let me put it this way. Will there be any changes to the Tom Thibodeau circle of trust um, as the series goes along? I think we definitely learned that like we knew, jo- uh, you know, Tibbs loved Josh Hart last year when he got here. I don't think we knew the extent to which Tom Thibodeau loved Josh Hart until the playoffs when he essentially did not take him off the floor, despite the fact that he, he brought with him some, some very uh, real concerns. I, I, I suspect that the five starters will be the, the five players that like remain in the, the circle of trust. Um, I don't, you know, I, I, you could you could tell me that someone else that someone moves out, somebody moves in. Like it's funny you brought up Deuce. Let me just ask you before I, I continue talking. Uh, how many minutes a game do you think Deuce plays in the series? Because we were talking about this last night. So Deuce is the guy who I think there's the chance that he graduates into the. Um, that's, that's why I, I, I truly trust you, uh, class, which is a very prestigious class to be in, and because I do strongly believe that. Last year, I mean, he turned to Deuce because he didn't have a ton of other options, of course. But we've talked about the learning moment that at least came from game six in Miami. And you would hope that, you know, if you're going to make mistakes, it sucks, but at least learn from them. Because if Deuce learns from them, then what we saw last year will have been worth it. Maybe not, but at least it's it's taking the experience and doing more with it. And we've seen what Tibbs trusts Deuce to do. The thing that comes to my mind instantly is look at how Tibbs tasked him with guarding Shea on that inbounds pass. And did Shea hit the shot? He did. Was yeah. OG Ananobi out? 
he was. But he was. it was still there is a level of confidence that is growing. And I I see it as almost like perhaps Deuce doesn't play big minutes, but the minutes he does play are, are big in are themselves. Are big. <laughs> yeah. Right. So that's my hope, certainly, yeah. because I would love to see him on Maxi in, in the same way where he did a great job on SGA. And of course, the most challenging part with SGA was the difference in height. That is not nearly as significant when it comes to Maxi. So that's what I'd hope for, certainly. Um, also, because I don't really know how many other options there are outside of uh, the starting five that can do exactly what Deuce McBride can do. I mean, I think to to some extent, like what the the question that I just asked, like a different version of this question is like, how many minutes per game can the starting five play? Um, so just again, a, a quick number here. So since the Randall and OG, since the yeah, since January twenty seventh, um, the current starting five: Brunson, Hart, Divincenzo, OG, and Obi and Hartenstein have played in eight games together, just eight games. That is that is it. There is a possibility that they will play about as many games in this series together as they will um, or, or as they would have, you know, since they, you know, that became essentially the version of the the, the starting five. In those eight games, they've played um, 128 minutes together. So that's obviously, if you're doing the math, it's about what's that, 16, 17 minutes per game. Um. Yeah. Whereabouts? They're awesome. It's plus fifteen points per hundred possessions. I don't think there's any question that that starting five is works perfectly together. Can Tibbs get it, it, it up to? Can Tibbs get it up to like twenty five minutes a game? Twenty four, twenty five. Like that's not crazy in terms of playing your best five men unit in the playoffs more than half of a game, and I. I could even see it getting a little higher than that because that when you look at how he has used these guys and how he like just, you know, he's going to trust Brunson, you know, he's going to trust OG and Obi. It would be shocking if he did not trust Josh Hart. Um, but then again, that would be the one spot. It's like, okay, deuce, get him in there. You get defense a little smaller, you're missing the rebounding. You're missing that kind of certain type of oomph that Josh Hart brings. Deuce Hart brings another type of type of oomph. You know, but I, I just I, I see him having hard out there when they're in, when it's the biggest minutes. Or suddenly it's Divincenzo. Maybe that's it. Maybe if there's a game where Divincenzo is not feeling it from three, Deuce because of the defense, right, steps in there. And that's calling Divincenzo a bad defender by any stretch. But then you know, I look and again, this is just hold on. Where the hell did it go? Yeah, this is just um, since. The Randall injury. So this is not Randall played none of the minutes that I'm about to talk of. In 872 minutes together, Hart, Brunson, and DiVincenzo, the, the Nova Trio, 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 <laughs> um, in th over 32 games since the Randall injury, plus 10.7 points per 100 possessions, 121.6 offense, 110.9 defense. Like 872 minutes, that is a massive sample size. It is by far the most minutes any trio on the Knicks has played um, since that time. Um, like these guys are good when they're on the floor together. Like they they know how to play with one another. They figure it out over the course of a long series. I think they will figure it out. Um. So yeah, I I don't I don't know, but I I just I, I when when we're when you when we're in our base set, so to speak, I have a lot of confidence. It's when we start to deviate from it that the questions get more interesting. It's a fair question. Yeah, I'd say my final one. It's less quantifiable and it's how physical do we think this Knicks team is going to be oh, that's because one. we know they're capable of playing their game but there's something to be said of setting a tone early where the other team's best player is hobbled and to be abundantly clear not calling for injuries or anything of the sort the Knicks can win in my opinion a seven game series with this team intact as they stand. But the prevailing question of last year, the Cavs were full of optimism, bright-eyed, excited. You hear the Jared Allen quotes about it. 
And then afterwards, they feel like they've been punched in the mouth. And a big reason is inexperience because they just sure outside of Donovan Mitchell, they were a team that largely had not been to the playoffs. Well, the Sixers are not the Cavs. The Sixers have made the playoffs every single year. So they are battle tested. The question, if you're the Knicks, is what message do you want to send right away? Philadelphia is coming into your building. You know that all season long, you have been the better team because you have beaten them, I believe three times out of four. And you also have the two seed. There's a reason you have home court advantage. So what statement do you want to make if you are the Knicks where you've got a division rival from an hour and a half by train away coming here with their best player who gets free throw calls unlike almost no other being able to, because these games probably will be officiated a little bit differently as well. What can you get away with? What can you do to really f- make Philadelphia adjust to you and your game plan? So uh, I think having a lot of physical players will be important. And it's why I would like to see do certainly get that level of time, but OG is going to do what he does quietly, but I could see Josh Hart being a little bit more animated. I could see Isaiah Hartstein maybe getting a little testier, like whatever it's going to be, do it to get them back on their heels. I like it. Um, I just went to look up. So I, there's no like hard line date about when the NBA decided to tell its officials to stick their whistles in their pockets. Um, and the numbers that I'm about to read are incredibly skewed for a reason that will be plainly obvious once once I get to it. When uh, as of the the number the date that's been th- that's been thrown about has been February 1st in terms of when the officiating changes kind of ser- started to go into effect. Before that point, or up until that point, the Sixers were sixth in the league in free throw rate. Since that point. Um, they have been 26th. Now, the obvious massive mm-hmm. giant blinking asterisk is the date that the <laughs> officiating changes allegedly went into place. The same is literally the day after Joel Embiid plays his last game, and Joel Embiid is the one who draws all the fouls. Um, it's funny. My 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 version of that question would be a little bit different. Is like, can the just more directly, can the can the Sixers or can the Knicks keep the Sixers off the line? Um, can they defend while keeping the Sixers off the line in this series? Can they exert their physicality while not putting the Sixers on the line in this series? Because that, to me, feels like the bailout that would even the series up. I, and I say even the series up, even though the Sixers are slight favorites. Um, we'll see. Look, we could have sat here and asked a dozen more questions each. I think it's a fascinating series. I also think like unlike a lot of series where you could really dig into the X's and O's. I don't know. I don't know that this is that much of an X's and O's series in it, relatively speaking. And it's just more of like, what are we going to get from really this player? I mean, cause that's what it comes out to, right? It comes out to a beat. What are we getting from a bead? Everything else goes from there because he dictates everything that happens on both ends of the floor. Um, and all we have to go on right now is what we saw last night. When what we saw last night was, was not great. So, uh, final thoughts before we both have to run. Should be a fun competitive series. I feel good about it. Oh, I, make a pick. Make a pick. I'm going to go with Nixon six. You're going to, okay. So everybody's Nixon six except me. I'm Nixon seven. Okay. I had thought about Nixon seven. I was operating on a lot of that timeline, but I just, I feel like they can steal one in Philly. It's going to be a good okay. crowd. I'm sure there'll be some Sixers fans in the garden, but I just can get, get the chance to end it in their building. It's a pretty sweet feeling. I'm, I am going on the assumption that each team will win a game in the other team's building. Um, and home court advantage will still favor the Knicks, but um, we'll see. Um, we'll see. It'll start on Saturday. It's going to be fun. Um, again, shout out to uh, T squared social hosting the watch party. Uh, which is promises to be a uh, rollicking good time. And I think that's it. Andrew, did I forget anything? Nope. That's it. Okay. <laughs> um, I will be back. You'll hear me next with an episode uh, on an episode with Fred Katz, which I'm recording later today. 
And I think we're going to drop that probably on uh, Friday, Thursday, going into Friday at midnight. Um, so more preview stuff coming your way. But uh, for Jeremy Cohen, I am Jonathan Macri. Thank you for listening to another episode of the Next Film School Podcast. We will be uh, back before you know it. He's up. <laughs>